ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for sticking around. Can you hear me all right? Um, so just before we start, this is uh, who you're going to call in event of emergency. Okay, and this is my one-man performance about adapting to climate change. Okay, and I'm a bit intimidated by all you climate scientists. Okay, so I just need to make clear that I'm not a scientist, and this isn't about science. It's about the human aspects of building resilience to climate change. Okay, and the first thing to remember about that is that no one can act alone on climate change. Okay, to build resilience to what's coming, we're going to need a coalition of the willing. So I'm hoping that from time to time, during the performance, some of you will be willing to help me out a bit. Okay, now, don't worry, I'm not going to ask anybody to do anything embarrassing. Okay, it's me that's going to embarrass myself. All right, but we just need to play a couple of games, paint a couple of stage pictures, that sort of thing. Okay, so hopefully, when I call for help, some of you will jump in. Because if you don't, this will be quite a short performance. Great, just um, talk amongst yourselves for a minute, I'll be with you in a sec, thank you. By the way, if anybody's wondering why there's a record player on the stage, it's um, uh, so that I can operate the sound cues myself. It gives me the illusion that I'm in control of the situation. It's Tuesday the 19th of July, 2022. Do you remember it? The United Kingdom is sweltering under the hottest temperatures ever recorded. It was baking yesterday too, Monday, but the mercury hardly dropped at all overnight. So today started off uncomfortable and has only got more so. <laughs> For the first time in history, parts of the country have clocked in temperatures of more than 40 degrees Celsius. Many schools have closed. Many offices have closed. Major train lines have closed because the rails are buckling in the heat. The London Fire Brigade is battling more wildfires than at any time since the Blitz. And I'm sitting at home, melting. <laughs> I I'm one of the lucky ones because I can at least work from home, but I can't focus on anything because, well, I just feel clammy in the heat. I, I decide to try and figure out which is the coolest spot in the house. The dog has clearly decided that it's the kitchen floor from which he will not move. But he looks hopelessly pathetic and his little rib cage keeps lurching in and out as he pants for breath. Unable to settle, I go to my record player and I put on Katrina and the Waves' classic single, I'm walking on sunshine, woo-hoo, and don't it feel good? Nobody else in the house thinks this is funny and I'm politely asked to turn it off. Glancing at the sleeve of the single, I notice that the nerdy child I once was recorded the precise date on which he bought it the 1st of June, 1985. And I'm thinking how I was younger then than my own daughter is now. And I'm remembering how <laughs> uh, growing up in Sheffield, it, it used to be a regular thing in winter to get snow so deep you had to wade through it. 
almost up to my child-sized knees. I'd been making deep holes in the crisp, new, crunchy white carpet. And I'm trying to remember when the last time was that I saw snow like that. And I'm, I'm wondering what the weather is going to be like by the time Eleanor is my age. And I'm reading online about how train, like, trains, tra train tracks don't necessarily buckle in the heat if you paint them white to reflect the sun, and how this is standard practice in some parts of Europe. They even have little trolleys that whiz along the tracks, depositing paint. But here in England today, we've sent railway workers out in 40 degree temperatures to paint the tracks white by hand using paint brushes. And I'm thinking, are we really this badly prepared? But then I'm thinking, well, whose job even is it to prepare us? Because I know it isn't mine. Stephen, could I ask you just to reach in this bucket and see what you can find? Great. What's that? What can you do with par a parcel and some music? Pass the parcel. <laughs> On you go. Yeah. Oh, it's leaking sand. Look. Okay. Keep you going. Yep. You all know how this works. Who's got the parcel? Aleka. 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 Alaka, uh, would you mind just opening a layer for that? Thank you. Now, um, for those of you, anybody not familiar with this game, it's called Pass the Parcel, okay? But we're playing a special variant on it today, which is called Whose Job Is It Anyway? Okay, um, and uh, what does it say on your lanyard there? Parliament, Parliament. marvelous. Would you mind, Alaka, playing Parliament for us? You don't need any particular skills for this role. <laughs> you just need to be able to answer yes, no, or I don't know to any question that you might be asked. Do you think you could manage that? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and, and would you mind taking your parliamentary seat just here? Great. Uh, pass the parcel on, yeah, before you go. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> just, just here, brilliant. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just to reiterate, yes, no, yeah. or I don't know. Okay. Or you can say anything you like. Okay. okay. Who's got the parcel now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Just uh, if you'd unwrap a layer, sir, that'd be marvellous. Okay, um, so uh, Parliament. Yeah. Yes. Um, do you think it's your job to prepare the country for the impacts of climate change? Yeah. You do? Marvellous. Good. What are you doing about it? <laughs> I don't know. You, you don't know? Okay. Well, um, maybe it would help if I told you that uh, back in 2008, Okay, when, when Gordon Brown was still the Prime Minister, if you can remember that far back, well, Parliament passed a, a, a bill called the Climate Change Act. Okay? And among other things, this act established the National Adaptation Programme, or NAP. Are you fond of a NAP? Um, um, yeah. Good, Sorry, good. I, I forgot I'm talking to the Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> well, if Parliament may be fond of a NAP. For, anyway, so um, now, in this act, uh, it establishes a National Adaptation Programme and uh, that's supposed to prepare the country for climate change, okay? And every five years, there has to be a report on the progress we're making, okay? Do you think you're responsible for writing that report? Um, no. No, why not? Um, I think there should be an independent body. You think it should be delegated to yeah. somebody? Should we find out who you delegated it to? Yeah. Okay, um, uh, who's got the parcel? Uh, what is it saying on your little land yard? DEFRA, marvellous. Um, do you know what that stands for, sir? Yeah, it's, it says it in small print on the back. So, yeah. Would you, <laughs> would you mind coming and taking a seat next to Parliament for me, sir? That would be marvellous. Uh, just keep the parcel going, if you would. Just, just here, marvellous. What's your name, sir? Wolfrich. Now you're different, okay? Um, so you can say yes, no, I don't know, or anything else you want. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, uh... Yes, sir, if you wouldn't mind unwrapping a layer, that we'll be with you in a minute. So, um, so DEFRA, yeah. Parliament has put you in charge of the National Adaptation Programme. Why do you think that is? Um, it seems like it's a, it's a government right, right of the people. 
Yeah. Um, oh. We've been we've obviously been told by Parliament that, that yeah. under the Climate Change Act, as you yeah. say, that we need to do this. Yeah, but why did they pick you? Why did I? Um, Maybe because environment is in yeah, your title. Of okay, great. Yeah. So, um, what are you adapting exactly? Um, to a set of climate risks that Parliament has identified with expert support. Yeah. Now, this is your first day, isn't it? So, uh, maybe we'd better do the orientation. Uh, okay, so uh, this is from the, the last uh, NAP report. Actually, yeah. it was 2018. There's another one due this year, but sure. for now, this is what we're working with. Okay, so um, it says, we have set out approaches to developing greater ecological resilience on land and in lakes and in rivers. Sound good to you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, protecting important wildlife habitats, increasing and improving our management of the seas. How do you feel about managing the sea? Uh, challenging to us. Yes, yeah, yeah. That, that's fair, yeah, okay. Um, so you're doing sort of environmentally things, yeah? Uh, but Deborah, what I really want to know is, whose job was it to think about painting the railway tracks white before the heat wave happened? Well, it, it should have been us, I suppose. It, it should have been you, yeah. but it wasn't? But it wasn't. Maybe because, you know, trains are somewhere outside of your department? Uh, transport department. Ah, yeah, but you're in charge of the National Adaptation Programme. That's true. So we would request the transport department to lean into... To lean into? To lean into. To lean into. Uh, okay. Um, I'm sensing a certain lack of joined-up thinking in central government about this. <laughs> okay, let's see, uh, let's see who else... Um, Oh, oh, no, yeah, but that's all right, because it says here, look, um, adapting to our changing climate cannot be done by government alone, that's conveniently. True. So uh, maybe we'd better see who else can help. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, who are you, sir? A You're a local authority. Fantastic. Would you mind coming and taking this seat for me, please? Uh, did we pass the parcel on? <laughs> uh, that's my seat, sir. There we go. Marvellous. Right, thank you for joining us. So if you can say anything you want, but if you say yes, no, or I don't know, is it just fault? Okay. If you, if you wouldn't mind just unwrapping a layer, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So um, uh, you're a local authority, sir? Yes. Uh, so that means you're a city council or a regional council or something like that? Yeah. Do you want to pick one? Um, <laughs> Norwich. Norwich City Council, a fine city, I believe. I yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, now it says here in the National Adaptation Programme that many climate risks are relevant to the responsibilities and functioning of local government. How do you feel about that? Uh, apprehensive. Okay. Uh, and, and what are you going to do about it? I don't know. Uh, well, fortunately for you, DEFRA doesn't actually expect you to do anything in particular about it. It says here, um, the Secretary of State does not intend to direct organizations to report. Government considers that a voluntary reporting process is the most constructive and collaborative approach. Okay, uh, now bearing in mind that you're a little short-staffed at the moment because you've taken a 37% cut to your core funding over the last decade, hasn't it, Parliament? Yeah, um, what, kind of, what kind of a priority do you think you're gonna place on them um, writing voluntary reports? Um, we've got social care to do. Yeah, and, and empty uh, bins. Yeah, all this other stuff. It's not gonna, it's gonna, we'll get round to it. Okay, maybe we better see who else can help. Um, so, uh, who are you, sir? I'm a sustainability officer. You're a sustainability officer, fantastic. Would you mind coming and taking a seat just here? Uh, a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, please. We've, we have a winner in our game of whose job is it anyway, okay? Because as a sustainability officer, it is actually your job to think about climate change, okay? The only problem is you're probably going to have to do it all by yourself. The rest of you can go back to your seats. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, as a, as a sustainability officer, you're probably in a team of one or two for your whole organisation. So, uh, lead teaching hospitals, for example. Uh, from a staff of 20,000 people, there's basically one of you. Okay, so it, it can feel a, a little isolating. Okay. Do you mind uh, reaching in here and see what you can find, sir? Uh, how, how do you imagine that feels? 
to be the one person in your whole organisation who's been tasked with saving the planet? Um, it's too much responsibility for one man, I would say. Too, too much just for you? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit daunting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I got really interested in that question, in, in uh, how it feels. Uh, and so I started talking to sustainability officers about that. And, and I even met one, uh, let's call him Ben, who um, he started a network group for other people in similar jobs in other organizations um, so that they could talk to each other about appropriate responses to climate risk a and just so they'd have someone to talk to. Um, where is the parcel now? Would you mind opening it up, sir? So inside here, we've got a bunch more lanyards with them. Um, the names of people in Ben's support network. In fact, I think Ben is, is on there, isn't he? Could you, could you give me Ben? Great, thank you. And if you could just pass the others round to anybody who feels that they would like to support Ben, uh, you don't worry, you don't have to come on stage because it's a remote network. They meet online, okay? But just anybody who'd like to be supported, that would be, that would be fantastic. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, be really, your support would be greatly appreciated. So, um, yeah. So I asked, actually, do you want to play Ben or would you rather I did? Um, do you want to do Ben? Okay, sure, sure. Do you want to give me that? Yeah. Okay, you can go sit down again. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, props. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. I asked Ben, how does it feel? I, I don't mind telling you that... Uh, I go in ebbs and flows, Ben told me. <laughs> I've been through early waves of climate anxiety and distress and come out the other side, but, well, anybody who's ever really looked at these issues is always in something of a revolving door, emotionally speaking, because, well, it is scary at the end of the day. And because you're looking to lighten the load and, and find things to feel positive about, well, it can be very easy to kid yourself. For years, I was in that old mold of sustainability people. You know, uh, let's do a bit more energy efficiency, a bit more recycling, a bit more riding a bike, and everything's gonna be fine. Look, we're 50% more energy efficient. Let's apply for an award. And uh, you get a nice certificate, and you can feel very proud of yourself. And it's only when you take a step back that you realize that you haven't actually changed anything for the better. You've just made it 50% less bad than it was. But it's still bad. And then about three or four years ago now, I, uh, I had my epiphany that maybe everything was not necessarily going to be all right. This was uh, partly tied up with the Extinction Rebellion stuff that was happening around that time, the uh, uh, Greta Thunberg stuff. And it dawned on me that, well, <laughs> Uh, the carbon reduction reports that I've been writing for all these years, they, they might be as much a part of the problem as they are a part of the solution. Because in writing those plans, it's like we're saying, it's okay, we've got a plan. When what we really need to be saying is, oh my God, we've got this potentially catastrophic situation coming towards us, and we really need to be doing something about it right now. Could I get three people... Uh, to come and help me uh, think this through right now. It doesn't matter if you've got a lanyard or not. Just anybody who feels compelled to want to try to do something about this, that would be really, really great. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, brilliant. Um, anybody else? Thank you, Alistair. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just uh, take this seat, this seat. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Alan, would you mind looking after bucket number one for me? Thank you. Could, could you tell me why you've stepped up? What, what made you want to help? You looked a bit, you looked a bit sad and lonely up here by yourself. Yeah, Some, yeah. Somebody has to help, I suppose. That's, that's very astute. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, can I just... Thank you. Should I ask you, uh, Anne, yes. to take bucket number two? And why, why are you here? I think it's everyone's responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and... Uh, Alistair. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? What, what made you stand up here, sit up here? Well, you've got to do something, haven't you? Yeah, so holding a bucket is <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, Ben told me that when he talks about climate risks, he tends to sort them into three buckets. 
That was the word he used. I may have taken it a bit too literally. Um, so in this first bucket, we've got uh, extreme uh, weather disruption events happening locally to you. So that's um, uh, storms, heat waves, wildfires, floods. <laughs> what impact will these things have? And I think most people now are, are pretty familiar with the idea that these things, your floods and your heat waves, will somehow need to be contained. But then you've got your higher order impacts that most of us haven't even started to think about yet. So um, uh, would you mind reaching in that bucket for me? Show us what you've got. Yeah, yeah so in the second bucket, we've got uh, supply chain insecurity, which basically means that if an extreme weather event happens, either locally or um, elsewhere in the world, Let's say this is elsewhere in the world. Um, well, it might stop us from getting the things we need to live on. And I'm talking about basic things here like food, water, medicine, energy. I mean, let's face it, energy security means keeping the lights on, doesn't it? Imagine trying to get through COVID without the internet. Oh, and that brings us to our third bucket. So in here, we've got all the increasing risks to human health and the increasing burden on the health system as a result of climate change. So that's all the effects of extreme heat, uh, declining mental health, an increasing stress and heart attacks, an increase in cancers from rises in heat and light intensity. We're probably looking at waterborne diseases like cholera, uh, with a warming climate, uh, we'll get more mosquitoes, which bring malaria. Oh, would you mind reaching in that bucket, Alistair, please? Let's see what you can find. Oh, yeah, yeah, and uh, we might also get more pandemics. Yeah, um, the emergence of novel viruses was predicted as a consequence of climate change uh, even before COVID-19, so something like that, or worse, will almost certainly happen again. These problems are not going away. So um, realistically, this is a realistic risk spectrum in the future. And it's really in these last two buckets that the truly insidious higher order impacts are going to be, but hardly anyone is even talking about these things. Uh, case in point, I'm working on a major new sustainability plan for my organization, and the initial document for that is 79 and a half pages, sorry, is 80 pages long, and the first 79 and a half of those pages are about carbon mitigation. And there's basically two paragraphs on the end about adaptation. So it's like, uh, yeah, we need to think about this too. So um, it can get pretty heavy on your shoulders, living with this knowledge day in, day out. I mean, it's your job, but it's always been difficult. How are we doing? Is everyone okay? Okay, thanks. Um, you can put those down and go back to your seats if you'd like. Hey, do you mind if I ask a question? Um, is that a yes? No. <laughs> uh, uh, if there's something strange in your neighbourhood, who are you going to call? Not the Ghostbusters. Okay. Uh, if there's something weird and it don't look good, who are you going to call? Oh, uh, the sustainability officer. The sustainability <laughs> Good choice, good choice. Um, uh, Marion, uh, if your house is burning down, who are you going to call? Fire brigade. Okay, good. Do you think that's likely to happen? Hopefully not. Okay. Are you insured against your house burning down? Absolutely, yeah. Great. Uh, are you insured against climate risks? No. No. Okay. Do you think climate change is happening? Yes. Okay. So to review, you're insured against things that you don't think are likely to happen, but not against clear and present threats. Is that, is that about right? Yes. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, Melina, if, uh, if your local council declares a climate emergency, who are you going to call? I don't know. Where's Sammy? Where's Sammy? Are you? Ah, oh, marvellous. Uh, Sammy, you work for Leeds City Council as a flood risk manager. Is that okay? Yeah. Great. Um, uh, do you remember which bucket we put floods in? Well done, one. Leeds declared a climate emergency in 2018. Sammy, your team waited to be told what that would mean for you in practice, but no further information was forthcoming. We're seeing a hell of a lot more incidents in recent years, Sammy told me. <laughs> oh, I'm not Ben anymore. Hold on. We're seeing a hell of a lot more incidents in recent years, Sammy told me. Uh, it used to be at one time we'd get a flood to deal with maybe once every couple of years. Other people at the council used to laugh at us. They'd say we were just sat in the office, twiddling our thumbs, waiting for a flood to happen. But then we started getting more and more of those big storms. Do you remember 2015? That was the first year they started giving names to storms. And uh, that same winter, we got uh, Storm Abigail, Storm Barney, Cloder, Desmond, and by now the ground is completely saturated. It can't take any more rain. And then Storm Eva came to visit for Christmas, and that was the storm that broke the camel's back. The rain had nowhere to go but into the river, and then the river went everywhere. The flooding across Leeds was the worst we've ever seen that Christmas. Since then, We've completed some major flood defence works on the River Air, so that should help to mitigate that particular problem. But, uh, well, just in the last couple of years, the weather seems to have changed again, and uh, now we're getting more and more of a problem with uh, surface water flooding. Let me explain. So, um, my team, Sammy told me, my team, we investi basically investigate all flooding in Leeds, near enough, with the uh, flood detectives the ghostbusters of unexplained flood phenomena. If an incident occurs, we'll go out there, we'll try and figure out what's happened, what's gone wrong, we'll probably make an emergency repair. Well, uh, but as investigators, it can get very frustrating because a lot of the time there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop exactly the same thing from happening all over again in exactly the same place. See, um, the, the drainage systems the sewers under the streets, right, they're basically Victorian, okay? So to begin with, uh, there was plenty of capacity in the system because the Victorians over-engineered everything, didn't they? But then, well, then the city kept growing. And, and I don't just mean outwards. Just think of all those people turning three-bedroom houses into five-bedroom houses or whatever. There's parts of Leeds where the population has grown by 35% with hardly any new homes being built, just from infill development. So that's more people on the same patch pouring more water down the same original drains. And then more people, well, that means more cars, don't it? Now, it used to be that maybe people had uh, grass in their front gardens, and that's very good for absorbing rainwater, but now they've paved them over for additional driveway space, and so there's nowhere for the rain to go but into the drains. So there's already far too much wastewater going into the system. And then, just in the last couple of years, we started getting these sudden, intense rainfall events. It's more of a, a, a tropical effect, like you can see in the Mediterranean, where the sky just opens and drops its entire load all at once. And our drainage systems are simply not designed to cope with that volume of water. And so, they're completely overwhelmed. Now, in, in 20 minutes, the rain has gone, the water's gone, but the damage has been done. People's homes have been flooded out by these sudden, intense downpours. And I just don't remember seeing that happen in previous years. Now, the stupid thing is that we could start to fix this problem. 
Uh, after the big floods of 2007, the government commissioned a, a big report, the Pitt Review, and that said, key point, there should be no automatic right for homeowners and developers to connect new builds to the existing sewer network. You can't just keep pouring more water down the same drains. Instead, we should be doing other things, like um, collecting it in uh, ponds, or in water butts, or installing porous driveway materials. They call it SUDS, Sustainable Urban Drainage. Only problem is that developers don't necessarily want to do any of those things if they think it's going to cost them more, right? And uh, some developers have a lot of political influence, which may be why 15 years after the pit review, SUDS is still not a legal requirement in England. In Scotland and Wales, yes, but not in England. No. Uh, now, they're saying that might happen next year, but that's next year, right? Jam tomorrow. For now, even as the lead local flood authority, we basically have no teeth to compel anybody to do the right thing. We just have to rely on you wanting to work with us voluntarily. Thinking about what Sammy had said, <coughs> I couldn't get my head around it. Flooding is expected. The problem is getting more intense as the climate becomes more erratic, and yet not only are we not adapting to that risk, we're still actively making the problem worse. Because the risk still doesn't seem real to us. Sammy, could I get you to come and help clean up your mess, please? about this drought you know the one that was declared across England last summer did it cause anybody to reduce their water usage flush the toilet less often maybe take shorter showers Aleka were you uh, were you incentivized at all to save water yeah you were okay great what did they do um, hose pipe bar. oh that's an incentive yeah well, <laughs> bands are always an incentive aren't they so what would you do if one day you turned the tap on and no water came out? Or uh, if you flushed the toilet and nothing went away? Um, I'd probably just eat everything and then go and do the thing and wait for everybody. So yeah. you, you try to do something about it? Yeah. 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 So it's fair to say that your water supply is quite important to you? Yeah. Do you remember which bucket we put supply chain issues in? Well remembered. Okay, so let's say that this bucket is uh, the water that's coming out at the end of our supply chain. So uh, this is the water in your taps at home, and you can, you know, wash your hands in it. And um, let's say, whew, let's say that this, this bucket here, as we've established, is the water that's falling out of the sky and flowing down rivers and down, uh, down drains, okay? So uh, how are we going to get this water from A to B. Uh, could I get some people to help me with the infrastructure here, please? Who'd like to be a water engineer? 
Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Uh, some more. I'm going to I'm going to put some music on and hope when I turn around there are five people in these chairs. Okay. <laughs> This is your bit of pipeline, okay? Don't let anybody take it away from you. Your bit of pipeline, sir. Your bit of pipeline. Your bit of pipeline. Thank you. Um, could you start trying to transport, transfer that money down that water down your pipeline? Uh, that's it. That's oh, marvellous. I love watching people work. That's it. See if you can get a rhythm going. Great. Yeah, keep it going, great. So, um, now, uh, uh, where's Khadija? Oh, Khadija, hi. Uh, you work for a major water company, okay? I'm not going to say which one, but it's based in Yorkshire, okay? <laughs> okay, spot the Yorkshire people, get that joke. Excellent. Now, um, your job title actually has the words climate change in it, which is still quite unusual, but we need to remember that water companies are completely dependent upon the climate on when and where and how much it rains for their core product, okay? Uh, does anybody want to guess how many other people Khadija works with in a climate adaptation team across the whole of Yorkshire? Correct. You're, Khadija, you're in a team of one and that's you, all right? Okay, now, um, with this drought, the water company has taken quite a lot of bad press. Maybe you've read some of it, yeah? But let me ask you this, Brian, do you think that water companies can magic rain out of the sky? No, I think you'd be correct, yes. So, uh, yeah, everybody thinks that we just had that one dry summer, but actually we've had a whole series of dry summers as well as some quite warm, dry winters. So we've had some very strange things happening. Like, um, as Khadija told me, a big fire up on Marsden Moor the other February. Now, uh, we never used to get wildfires in winter in this country, but now we're getting them in February because the ground is so dry. But still, people are like, oh, it rains all the time. Why should I save water? Now, when a drought occurs, the biggest issue is uh, a severe lack of rainfall in the local area. So uh, when you haven't got enough water going into your local supply, what are we going to do? Where are we going to get it from? Scotland? Scotland? <laughs> Interesting. So somewhere else, basically. Yeah, somewhere else. Okay. So um, let's say this is somewhere else. And um, how are we going to get that water from Scotland to, uh, to Yorkshire, which is where I am, as you gathered? Yeah. Uh, anybody? Uh, A pipe. If, if there was one, that would be great. Yeah. Pipeline. Great. Uh, any other suggestions? Yeah, yeah, we're probably going to have to uh, cart it around in tanker trucks, aren't we? Do, do we think that's going to be easy? Do we think that's going to be cheap? No, so uh, that's going to be more money out of our budget, isn't it? So, um, uh, Alan, would you mind being a tanker truck for me? Just, get, just go over to Scotland, since you suggested it. Uh, you, sir, would you mind being a, a tanker truck? And you, and you, sir, would you mind? So, yeah, just uh, keep, keep it coming, because we need lots of trucks. There's a lot of people in Yorkshire. Okay? Marvellous. Great. Yeah. Well, they're running low, for sure. Okay. Um, I said, keep it coming. Come on. Drive faster. <laughs> so, um, now, as Khadija explained to me, uh, when a drought occurs, water shortage is not the only problem. There's also infrastructural issues. So in Yorkshire, we have these clay soils, right? And when that soil shrinks, well, it compresses, basically because it's so dried out. And when that happens, if you've, if you've got a pipeline going through that soil, well, then it might move. And then it might burst. Okay? Um, now, it used to be that that kind of leakage event would happen mainly in the winter because of freeze and thaw effects, but now it's happening in the summer too because the ground is so dry, okay? So um, that means more emergency repairs, doesn't it? More, uh, more pipes that are going to need to be reinforced or replaced. So um, who's going to pay for all these additional costs, do we think? Water 
water customers, oh, oh, well, no, actually, there's this regulator called the Ofwat, and they're very, very strict about water companies putting their prices up. So you might not notice much effect in your bill. You might notice a different taste of water if it's coming from Scotland, but it uh, probably tastes nicer, to be honest. But uh, no, any, any other suggestions? Government? No, the whole point of privatisation. The government's not responsible, is it? Uh, anybody else? We're probably going to have to go to the banks, aren't we? Uh, so um, here it is, the white heat of capital. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, so we can issue some more shares, maybe, um, or more likely, probably we'll um, we'll sell some bonds, which is basically a form of borrowing. All right. So, uh, and in the short term, that means uh, that our water company is going to be more liquid <laughs> get it um, and that means that we can repair our broken pipelines and uh, yeah, that one too and everything will keep moving right but then um, well in the longer term those lenders are going to want their money back aren't they and, and they're probably going to want it back with interest so um, when you've not got enough money going into the emergency repair budget uh, what, what do you think is going to happen? Come keep the pipeline going, come on. <laughs> what, what, what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, what's going to happen? Well, we're, we're going to get more pipe leakage, aren't we? And maybe more uh, sewage discharge into rivers. In fact, more of the sort of thing that you might have been reading about. But don't worry, for now, there's still water coming out of your taps at home, isn't there? So there's no emergency here. No, nobody is going to have to bail anybody out. You guys have done a marvellous job. Thank you very much. You can take your seats. I could be wrong about this, but it seems to me that we're living simultaneously in a state of complete normality and a state of screeching emergency. Every time we hear about another monster flood in Pakistan or a, a monster hurricane in Florida or wildfires sweeping across France, we'll go, yep, climate emergency. But then, as oh, quick as we can, we'll try to think about something else, won't we? We'll, we'll try to get back to normal because normal is so much more reassuring, isn't it? Normal is what happened yesterday and the day before that. So surely normal is going to be what happens tomorrow, right? And that collective delusion means that we're completely unprepared when normal suddenly just falls apart. Like it did with COVID. We were completely unprepared for COVID. You remember this bucket? The health bucket. Where's Alexis? You're Alexis, marvellous. Alexis, you work as a sustainability officer for the NHS. Is that okay? Yeah, it's a job you sort of fell into by accident because you, you lost your job in the financial crash of 2008, so you were working for a temping agency. Okay? One day they called you up and they said, do you know anything about carbon, Alexis? And Alexis was like, what's carbon? And, she, and they go, can you write a carbon management plan? And she's like, uh, okay. And so, still as a temp, Alexis writes the first decarbonisation plan for Yorkshire's ambulance service. And she's still there today, fully employed. 
Does anybody want to guess how many other sustainability staff there are among the six and a half thousand people who work for Yorkshire Water, for the Yorkshire Ambulance Service? There's some zeros. Yeah. <coughs> You're still the only one, Alexis. Yeah. So it can get a little bit uh, hard work trying to engage other people with these issues, you know, in a, a 10 second lift conversation that you might get with uh, senior managers. But then COVID happened. Can I borrow your lanyard? We, we could have been better prepared, Alexis told me. Let, let's put it like that. And if we had been, well, then a lot of people's lives could have been saved. But lessons were learned because the pandemic was a wake-up call across the entire NHS because everybody could see that we needed to plan better and adapt better so as not to be caught napping again. Take a, a simple example. Face masks. We've always used a lot of them. Right? But with the pandemic, it was off the charts. And, and suddenly, everybody was like, how much waste are we generating? And it turns out that through the pandemic, the NHS churned through in excess of 3 billion face masks. And every one of those co correlates directly with climate change because they're made from plastic, which is made from oil, and then they're transported across the globe. So that's carbon, 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 carbon. Oh, oh and when we really looked into the supply chains, well, it turns out that the, uh, the face mask in your hand is not just a single-use medical item. It's something that might have been made by enslaved Uyghur people in China. There were face masks being made for the NHS by slaves. And, and then they get to the UK and they go on somebody's face. And then 10 seconds let, late, uh, later, the strap breaks and it goes in the bin and you reach for the next one. And then the bin is incinerated. Well, less so now. There are now 63 NHS trusts that have mandated only to use reusable face masks. So that's less waste, less carbon, and less reliance on dodgy supply chains. And that's just one of the examples of some of the big changes that have happened in the health service just in the last couple of years. Because the, the pandemic has galvanized an entire generation of doctors and health workers to say, actually, what can I do to make a difference? And that's been really invigorating to see. But we still need to do more. 63 NHS trusts is 63 out of 219. Thank you. For Alexis herself, the biggest challenge has been how to decarbonize the fleet. How do you make ambulances less reliant on fossil fuels and on the fragile international supply chains that bring them to us? Well, she... Uh, she picked all the low-hanging fruit first. She put solar panels on the roofs. She uh, changed the light bulbs. But eventually, Alexis realized, we're just going to have to uh, design a whole new ambulance. Could I get somebody to drive my ambulance for me, please? You just need to hold an imaginary steering wheel. Marvelous, thank you. And um, could we get a couple of paramedics to look heroic? You know you want to. Paramedics, anybody? Come on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, oh, and oh, we've got extra people. Great. And so one of you can be the patient. Who wants to be sick? You want to be sick? Marvelous. So paramedics here. Marvelous. And oh, you're the patient. Okay, just if you could just drape yourself across that. That's the bed. Okay, look, look, look sick. Could you minister to her, please? She's, she's direly, you know, so it's an emergency. Would you? Okay, great. Uh, okay, so um, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make a fossil-free ambulance that's adapted for the future? Anybody? Electric. electric. Okay, so uh, let's, let's think that through. Okay, so electric for an ambulance gives a range of about 100 miles. Okay, but then if we put a patient and two or three burly crew members on board, that range might drop to 80 miles because of the added weight. And then... Um, if we put all the equipment on board, like the defibrillators and so on, that's quite heavy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's going to you know, drop the range even further because of the added weight. And then if, if it's an emergency, uh, so the driver puts their foot down, come on, make an effort. Oh, it's speeding up. Okay, that's it, yeah, yeah, well, then the range is going to drop even further. And that's a bit of a problem when we've got to cover the whole of Yorkshire. Okay, so um, everybody said, well, thanks, 
Alexis, but um, you've done everything you can. We're just going to have to stick with diesel. And Alexis said, sod that. And she went and got herself a research and development grant. Okay? And by the end of that process, she had co-developed a brand new, fully functional, carbon neutral, hydrogen electric ambulance. It's got a range of, uh, it's got a hydrogen fuel cell that powers the battery, and it's got a range of 330 miles. So it does exactly what it needs to. And it's been adopted by the London Ambulance Service, and they showcased it at COP26 in Glasgow. Smile for the cameras, please. Cheers. The only problem is that back home in Yorkshire, we still don't have the infrastructure to support Alexis's ambulance because there's only one hydrogen refueling station in the whole of the region, and that's all the way down south in Sheffield. So for now, sorry Alexis, we're stuck with diesel. One of the big problems at the moment is a lack of capacity in the whole system, and this is a problem that goes way beyond the NHS. Okay, we, there's a lack of new infrastructure, there's a lack of uh, skilled workers to install and operate that infrastructure, there's a lack of training courses for those skills, there's basically a lack of everything. So how do we get past that lack of everything? Because as Alexis put it to me, we're still at the very bottom of the bell curve in terms of understanding what is actually happening to us. We're absolute beginners at this. Oh, wrong one. You can go back to your seat. Trees are green. Red roses, June. Red roses, June. I see them blue for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed day. Say goodnight, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of people going by. Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World. That was the UK's number one single on the day that I was born. The 1st of May, 1968. The day of revolution in the year of revolution. It seems like today we need about 45 revolutions per minute. But I keep coming back to something that Ben said to me. He said, it might seem like pie in the sky to imagine that we can change this whole broken system. But that's where I find a kind of hope, by trying to get people to think about how we could do that. I recently met a woman called Roz, who uh, lives in Sheffield, just across the street from the high school that I went to in the 1980s. Her front window looks out on uh, the field where I used to play rugby. 
Now, Roz has spent a career in public health, but she recently took over as the boss of a social enterprise called the Green Estate. It's up on a windy Sheffield hilltop, surrounded by what was once considered to be the most deprived council estate in England. She told me around the site. They've got these beautiful landscape gardens, an education centre, artist studios, you name it. They, they generate work for local residents, and they work internationally promoting landscaping solutions like uh, rainwater gardens, green roofs, sustainable urban drainage. They even grew a meadow at the Tower of London for the Queen's Jubilee celebrations. Now, Roz is um, modest and unassuming, but it, it's the quiet ones you need to watch, isn't it? For me, it's always about tackling injustice and inequality. So my version of adapting and becoming resilient isn't just about dealing with floods and, and droughts and heat waves. It's about mental health, too. It's about the mental health bit of, oh my God, this is what we're facing. And, and then of empowering people to feel like they can do something useful about it. Have you heard of green social prescribing? It's a simple idea, really, but all of the health research tells us that just going to the park or, or taking a walk or slowing down a bit and spending some time with nature, that these things can have real benefits for people's well-being. So one of the simple things we could be doing in terms of adaptation is to think about creating more green space and more resilient green space in our communities. You know, a bit more shade from the heat. Now, that green space might not look all neat and manicured. In fact, it probably shouldn't. Let's say um, a neighbour of yours has let their front garden get all overgrown. To the naked eye, it might just look like a tangle of weeds. But that's okay. Instead of blaming that neighbor for letting their front garden get out of control, thank them. Why not thank them? Thank you for not paving over your yard for an Audi. Thank you for creating a habitat for insects and butterflies and, and doing your bit for biodiversity. Now, <laughs> that, there might be all kinds of personal reasons why that neighbor just can't cope with gardening at the moment. So why not help them out a bit? You don't have to do much. Just trim around the edges of the tangle so that it looks intentional, it looks framed. And then maybe put up a sign for passers-by. This is for the earth. Or, let's say, uh, a tree, an old tree, finally gives up the ghost and blows over in the grounds of your local school. Great. Leave it there. Let that tree decompose and watch what happens in and around it. Because in its death, that tree is providing new life for all kinds of things. Your kids could have lessons around that tree and learn all kinds of things. And actually, every one of us needs to learn that nature is not just some, you know, pretty add-on to our neatly ordered lives. It's not just some feel-good factor. We're a part of nature. We're a part of that cycle of life and death, of unmaking and remaking. And we're going to need to understand that and work with it in the years ahead. We need to build community in the belly of our dying tree. We need to create a sense of belonging and a sense that we can make necessary changes right here where we live. Because we've got it all wrong at the moment. The power is in all the wrong places and far too far away. But my plea is that we take a different approach to hierarchy, right? And we, we turn it on its head. And we say, look, we are a group of human beings who live together in this place. And, and together, we've got all kinds of expertise and insights and assets, whether you're in a formal position of power or whether you're a volunteer or a teacher or a mom. And together, by pooling those resources, we could be collectively powerful. And we're going to need to do something, right? The time scale is against us. But COVID-19 showed us that we can adapt quickly. We had to, and we did. So how do we create the conditions where people understand that it's that urgent?
I said at the beginning that we need a coalition of the willing, and we do. A coalition of people willing to work their way into the cracks between the structures that just aren't working for us at the moment and, and, and to plant seeds in those cracks. How could you, how could we act together to make ourselves more resilient and take some of the burden off people like Ben and Khadija and Sammy and Alexis? Because this, this is everybody's job. These twists of paper on the floor are uh, seed paper. They contain wildflower seeds. If, if you plant them, they will grow. <laughs> now, those flowers probably wouldn't live very long, but inside each twist of paper, there's something that might. The seed of an acacia tree. It's a tree that you'll find growing in some of the hotter parts of the world, but it's also quite at home here in the UK. So in a moment, I'd like to invite anybody who'd like to to come and, and take one of these seeds and, and, and take it home and, and maybe plant it in a pot on your windowsill and, and nurture it with your hopes for the future. And then maybe one day that acacia will be big enough for you to take it outside and, and replant it. And then maybe one day that tree will still be there standing tall and strong and resilient long after we've all gone. And every year, it will blossom gloriously in yellow. Thank you for listening.